All right, welcome everyone to our next CU Prime talk of the semester. So my name is Tyler. I'm a current grad student here in the physics department. And if you don't know what CU Prime is, we are a student group uh, that's dedicated to increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus and building a community within the physics department and beyond in other sciences. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is by hosting this talk series where we get graduate students and other researchers to present their research in a way that is uh, able to be understood by all. And so welcome everyone who's here. Welcome everyone who's joining, who's joining online as well. And uh, for people in person, I think we still have some more pizza. So feel free to get that at various uh, times throughout the talk. We also have times uh, where we'll be discussing amongst with each other. Um, so feel free to get to know the people next to you during those times and maybe branch out and meet some new people. Um, also, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to interrupt, and otherwise we'll go and get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Leah Henkla, who is a fifth year grad student studying black holes. I'll let you take it away, Leah. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today to tell you about what black holes really look like. But first, I am supposed to tell you a little bit about myself. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Lafayette, Colorado. My office is right over there in that tower. Um, so I can almost see my childhood home from my office, but not quite. Uh, I went to the East Coast for, for college, and then I decided I wanted to go to Germany for a year. So I did research in Germany for a year. And then I was like, I really miss the mountains, and I like Boulder. So I came back to Boulder for grad school. Um, basically, how I got interested in physics was I just have always really liked black holes. This was my face when I found out black holes. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Uh, this is my cat in turns 20 on Friday. Um, and this excitement has never really gone away. Every time I get to tell people about how I do black holes in general relativity, and it blows my mind because it's so awesome. So feel free to ask me lots and lots of questions because um, I know I was always interested in black holes. So. Today, I want to talk about how we actually see black holes are out in the universe. But first, I want to make sure that everybody is just on the same page about black holes. So really fast, raise your hands, tell me what you know about black holes. Anything. RP. Light can't escape. Light can't escape from the black hole. OK, so if you're uh, inside the event horizon of a black hole, there's a surface called the event horizon. And if you're inside of it, then you would have to travel faster than the speed of light to get out of it, right? So not even light can escape from the event horizon of a black hole. Anybody else? They're pretty massive. They're pretty massive, yeah. So black holes can be anywhere from um, somewhere like around the size of our sun in terms of mass up to billion, billions of times the mass of our sun. Yes? Is it true that they're not part of our universe? Yeah, so you cannot observe things that are inside the event horizon because the way that you observe things is how we uh, is by seeing light and light can't escape from a black hole. And that actually is exactly what I want to talk about today is how do we actually see black holes. Um, so another thing really fast, black holes are actually very simple objects. So they're described by, you know, people usually say they're described by three numbers, but I like to add a little bit more because, you know, there's a where in space are they? So position in space, how fast are they moving relative to some other objects? And then the things you've probably heard about. So mass, which we talked about. Um, charge of a black hole can change the shape of the event horizon. In astrophysics, we usually say that the charge is zero. And the argument goes something like this. If you can imagine you have a black hole and it has a net charge, so like a, a positive charge on it, it's going to repel other positive charges, right? That's the Coulomb. Coulomb's law, and it's going to attract negative charges. It's going to do that until it meets a, uh, a charge of zero. So we're basically just going to assume that any deviations from a zero charge are temporary and negligible. Uh, the last property is spin. So black holes spin, and that changes how much they bend the space time around them. And of course, the event horizon, which is where gravity is so large that um, you can't see anything that gets out of it. Okay, so this is kind of the question of the day here, which is, as we were saying, you can't observe things that um, 
So we observe things that emit light, right? The way we see things is by photon hits my eyes. And the event horizon, no light can escape from within the event horizon. So what the heck is this, this picture? And I'm gonna kind of build up to that in the next five minutes. But first, we're gonna do a discussion with your neighbor. So turn to your neighbor, and I have some prompts here, but basically I want you to think about what happens when a star approaches a black hole. So think about how big is a star relative to a black hole? Does a star always fall straight into the black hole? Does it get ripped apart? Okay, go. All right, start wrapping up. Wow, okay, that was fast. All right, okay, <laughs> great. Thank you, everybody. Oops, let me delete this timer. <laughs> yeah, you are. Wow, okay. Does anybody know how big is a star relative to a black hole? There's my timer. Anybody? There's no, nobody? Yeah, I am. Much bigger. Much bigger. <laughs> Excellent guess. Excellent guess. Yes, in terms of like radius. Yeah. Well, I would say it's more massive, so it has more mass, but the radius is the kind of advantage since it's like more dense. Right, yeah. So black holes are super, super dense, right? Which is why um, they're so interesting. But the size of the black hole, as I think you were just saying, was strongly dependent on how big your black hole is. So I'm just going to give you an example of one of the biggest black holes, uh, which is uh, a, a million times the mass of our sun. The event horizon of that is like right about the um, orbit of Mercury. Okay, so now we will discuss, does a star fall straight into a black hole? What did you, what did everybody think? Yes, no, no, okay. Why not? Nice, yeah, okay. So if you think about, we have a actually very small um, black hole, right? And we have a star coming towards it. The star is like never gonna be pointed straight onto the path of the black hole. And even if it is, then if it's a smaller black hole, then the star is gonna be bigger than the black hole. Um, so it will not just get sucked into the black hole and just totally disappear immediately. Instead, I have a video of what happens. Let me know if you can see this. Okay, so this is a picture of, you can see the black hole and all this lensing effect, and then there's gas around it, and then there's that star right there that's about to meet its doom. <laughs> black hole, star. Now it's getting stretched because of tidal forces, so gravity's stronger on one side of the black hole, um, one side of the sun than the other. Bam! Ooh. Yeah, so it doesn't go straight in, right? It, it goes around and starts forming <laughs> lots of very cool, pretty structures. Yeah, okay, very nice. So, Jacob has a question. Uh, I assume it's like a simulation. Yeah, this is a simulation. Real, like, and I assume you could do different ways, like, sort of parts of this. Yeah. But, like, how well does that simulation have like, uh, experimental? I mean, this simulation probably doesn't even have radiation in it, so it's just a model for things. Oh, um, really just yeah, but you can do sorts of things like for um, this is a tidal destruction event when a star gets torn apart, and you can match things like how fast does the light decay over time. And okay. I mean, that's an open field of people debate okay, this so a lot, right? Better. Yeah, but, but there are models to describe that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, what, what do we see here? Um, what we see is this star is now boop. Um, it has been torn apart into an accretion disk. That's what we call this disk of matter that is going around the black hole and it's accreting onto the black hole. And in addition, you can see there are these really collimated structures here. So they're going like straight up perpendicular to the accretion disk and those are jets, okay? So back to our question of if a black hole is like black by definition, and how do we see things like the picture of the black hole? Uh, the answer is that we don't, right? We see the jet and we see the accretion disks. Pretty nice, right? So this, oops, this is um, a picture, uh, you might recognize it. This one is a picture of um, 
think this one's M87. Yeah, no, this one's M87, yeah. So this is a picture of a black hole at the center of a galaxy far, far away um, called M87. And you can see this light here. This is light that's coming from really, really close to the black hole. So it's like forming kind of the accretion disk and the, the area around the accretion disk. Um, and then you might ask, where's the jet? Well, if we zoom out a lot, you can see this is the same galaxy. You can see the very innermost section. That's where we see the inside of the black hole. And then we see this ginormous jet. This, this thing is thousands of light years long. And we think that's because the black hole is powering the jets that come over, over there. Okay, so the lesson here is that real, like astrophysical black holes out in the universe they are surrounded by stuff and they like to eat that stuff right so they will eat all sorts of things like stars, for instance. Um, this is an artist's impression of a black hole that's about 10 times the mass of our sun, so you can see it's just a little tiny dot right there and then there's an accretion disk around it and it happens to be eating a star. So this is what's called an x-ray binary or a binary system. Um, and they're actually pretty rare because the star has to be really close to the black hole in order for gravity to start pulling the material off of the star. So there aren't very many of these systems, but when we see them, they're really cool for studying accretion disks and jets. Yeah. Um, stuff gets really close to it and then disappears into the event horizon and the black hole gets bigger because it got more mass. Okay. Yeah. What's what? Ooh. Okay. So this is what? <laughs> this is probably within about 10 gravitational radii. Um, so probably somewhere around the size of Mercury. Like, so the, the event horizon itself is about, actually this is a, a black hole that's a, mil, a thousand times bigger than the one I told you about earlier. So it's, it's probably within the size of the solar system, although I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. But it's actually much, much smaller. Yeah, it's really, really close to the black hole. Yeah, like general relativity is really important here. And actually this shadow here, um, was a prediction of general relativity. Um, and because gravity was so strong here, they were able to use the lack of light here to predict the presence of a black hole shadow and was testing one of general relativity's predictions. Um, I've never really understood this picture. What yeah. angle are we looking at it from, especially in context with the jet there? Like, yeah. That would imply we're not looking at it from top down. Right. Right, so this black hole is probably spinning because we get this jet and we think that the jets need to extract rotational energy of the black hole to launch a jet. Um, this jet is pointed at 17 degrees to us, so if we're looking at it like this, it's like that or something. Um, and so basically, the black hole spin is coming out something like that. Um, in this picture, we actually think that this brighter part is because that's the material that's coming towards us. So it's getting Doppler, Doppler brightens. Um, the intensity is getting bigger because it's coming towards us. And then this is thinner because it's going away from us. So it's kind of rotating, like coming in and out of the bridge. That makes sense? More questions? Alrighty, I will keep going then. Um, yeah, okay. So I just told you about these stellar mass black holes that like eat stars. Um, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies can also eat stars. Um, they also eat things like, um, there's a lot of leftover gas in the universe. It's just kind of floating around and that gas can orbit the black hole and get eaten by it. Um, and then also you might've heard of black holes eating other black holes. So for instance, um, a lot of recent progress was made in detecting gravitational waves. And so if you have two black holes orbiting each other, this situation is even more rare than this situation, right? Because in order to form this situation, we think you have to have this already rare situation, and then this star has to also turn into a black hole. So this is super rare, but we know they exist now. Um, so this is when you have two black holes that are orbiting each other, they start emitting gravitational waves, which is like the bending of the actual space time itself. It's not light like the photons that you see. Um, and then when these merge, things like LIGO or LISA in Europe can detect these signatures. 
Uh, so what I do in my day-to-day -day life is I study black hole accretion disks and jets. And because these black holes and jets are composed of plasma, right, a star is already plasma, um, and then when it gets closer to the black hole, it gets even, even hotter. So it's just electrons and protons zooming around. There's no way to form atoms because it's just too hot to combine. Everything just gets ripped apart. Um, and so I do a lot of plasma physics and astrophysics. So I'm a plasma astrophysicist. OK, now we're going to do another exercise. This is two truths and a lie. So your job is to figure out which one of these three things is false. And you have one minute. Go. All right, everybody, this was a 33% probability of success, so you all have had enough time to discuss, right? All right. All right. OK, now we're going to take a poll. Who thinks that number one is a lie? Who thinks that number two is a lie? Who thinks that number three is a lie? And how did you all know that I put the, the one that's wrong? Yeah, OK. Yes, this was probably, uh, you probably could just guess that accretion disks was the one that was wrong because I want to talk about it. So, yes, um, we actually do observe water on the moon. There was, in fact, a recent mission, which was basically a big plane that detected water on the moon. It's called SOFIA. Uh, and then there was a mission called Cassini that flew around Saturn, and it actually flew over a methane sea on Titan before it crashed into Saturn, and we never heard from it again. And that was on purpose. So the thing that was false was we don't observe accretion disks around stars. So as you might be able to imagine, um, as I think one of you pointed out, um, if you have a, an object that is not pointed directly at the star, at a black hole or a massive object, so it has a little bit of angular momentum, it's just going to go around, right? And this doesn't matter whether the central object is a star or a black hole. So there are lots and lots of different types of accretion disks. For instance, there are disks around stars that are actually forming planets, and this is real data here. So this is an artist's impression, but this is real data of a young star that has surrounded the gas that was around it and formed a, um, a disk of material and is actually forming planets in that disk. Another, um, you can imagine having central objects that's really dense, that is a neutron star, for instance. Um, Neutron stars are also very dense objects, and so they can also kind of accumulate gas and dust around them. Uh, and that is, yeah, you can do the same thing with white dwarves, they're also pretty compact. And that is an artist's impression of that white dwarf sucking mass or pulling mass off of a, a star here. Uh, and then finally, as we've kind of touched on already, there are disks not only around stellar mass black holes, but also supermassive black holes, and that is picture of the supermassive black hole right there. Um, so what I kind of wanted to get in now was what do black hole accretion disks actually look like? Like if we were to go out and try to see one, what would it look like? Um, and this is what I'm going to do here. You've probably seen this electromagnetic spectrum uh, before. Just note that the radio waves are over here and the gamma rays are over here, so it might be backwards of what you're used to. Now I'm going to show you some telescopes and the objects, the accretion disks that they can actually observe. Okay, so first, um, this is not an accretion disk, it's a jet, but that huge jet coming from the center of a galaxy, we can observe that with a, um, a very large array in the radio waves. I actually got to visit this when I was in high school. It was very cool. It's in New Mexico. You can go. Um, there's also, for instance, those protoplanetary disks that are forming planets. And the supermassive uh, black hole accretion disks tend to be right around in this area. There's things like the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, and then the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile that measure in these wavelengths and make these pictures. There's also um, accretion disks around white dwarfs, which I showed you the artist's impression of earlier. And they emit somewhere around in here, uh, this area, so Hubble, um, the James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes observe in those wavelengths. And then finally, these artists, this artist's impression of a stellar mass black hole, those emit in the X-rays. These are very high energy systems. Uh, and so the, black, the um, things that observe 
those are gender affirming all sorts of different telescopes. Question. It looks like you have a question. Why do supermassive black hole disks have a black hole that's supposed to only mass black hole disks? Did everybody hear the question? Okay. Is um, the question was why do black hole like supermassive black hole disks emit in lower wavelengths than uh, stellar mass black hole region disks? So the reason actually you can do a scaling of it requires some some math <laughs> basically, but um, you can show that the how much stuff falls onto it is. Um, there's some math. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can I can send it to you later if you want. But um, yeah, it's basically a question of like you can kind of think about it this way: if you are at a um, a supermassive black hole, your event horizon is much bigger, and so if you're like orbiting around, you have less energy. I think maybe that that might be wrong. Awesome. Okay, never mind. Uh, yeah, I don't have a good physical answer for you. Not, not those. My yes, my apologies. Okay. Um, what? Oh, question. Yeah. On the last slide, would it be just like loosely correct to say that there's an inverse relationship between the mass of the black hole, or the mass of the body, and the energy of the like the, the frequency of the wavelengths? Yeah, the and that's what math tells me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And because this is um. I wanted to show you what I actually do and what um, the difference between what we observe and the simulations that I um, do. This is a simulation. I didn't do this simulation, but it's of a gas cloud that's falling onto the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Okay, so you can see the gas cloud coming in. And then there are all these different stars. These are the stars that are inside, and you can see it's kind of like going around and it's you can't see it here, but it's, it's forming a little disk around in there. Okay, so this is a pretty nice video, right? Now, what do we actually observe? Yeah. What do we observe? Oh, yes. This is what we observe. That's the gas cloud. The black hole's probably right there. And then those are the stars around. <laughs> <laughs> So the job of uh, uh, theorists in astrophysics is to take this and come up with this and to try to figure out what physics do I need to put in to understand what's going on and trying to reproduce this from um, our models. Okay. Oops. Okay, so now I'm going to focus a little bit more on X-ray binaries, which are the stellar mass black holes, so the like 10 times the mass of our sun, and what do they look like? Uh, first of all, X-ray binary, it's in a binary system because it's a black hole or a neutron star plus a star, and the, the star is accreting onto the black hole. And it's X-ray because it emits in the X-rays, unlike those other types of accretion disks we just talked about. Okay. Um, Okay, so here are some pictures of an X-ray binary. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but I can't tell that that's a binary. Uh, it just looks like it's one big blob, right? Like, how do we even know that's a binary? And that's actually um, one of the problems here, right? Is that we don't have observations that are these things are really far away, right? So if you imagine putting two things. Uh, really close together and really far away, you can't tell that there's two objects there. And that's basically what's happening in these two pictures. So we don't actually see the accretion disk spatially resolved. We can't tell, oh, there's gas that's uh, actually in a disk. We just have blobs. So how do we look at it? I'm going to show you, um, this is a spectrum. How many people have seen a spectrum before? Okay, okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit of how to read this sort of a thing. This is uh, energy here. So this is the frequency of a photon, right? You can just convert that to energy. And then um, this is in units of kiloelectron volts, which is, you know, you divide by stuff. But it's uh, a measurement of how energetic the photon is, or like what color a photon are you seeing? And then the y-axis is how much of each color do you see? So right here, you can see that we see the most photons 
at about a kilo electron volt. That corresponds to a temperature of about 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So that's really, really hot. Um, and this, I just want to point out, this is the full range of the spectrum. Right here, we're looking at a small range in the x-rays. So if you were to look at this, one of these things in um, the radio or microwave, you would not see this sort of a thing. This is only in the x-rays. Uh, yeah, so we don't, again, we don't know where this light is coming from. We're just hypothesizing that this comes from an accretion disk and building models for the accretion disk and then testing those models. We don't actually see the disk. Okay, so this is um, a theoretical physicist's favorite tool, cartoons. Um, so this, these are pictures of a cartoon of an X-ray binary accretion disk. So this is the black hole right here. And you can imagine if the um, black hole accretion disk is like a donut, so it's just going around like this, and you take a slice through here and you look at it from the center, then you'll see, you'll see gas out here and gas out here. And then if I flip the donut down and look at it straight on, then I'll just see like a CD sort of a, a thing here. Um, and again, we have never observed this because we don't have the spatial resolution to tell this apart from a neighboring star or apart from other things. So um, the velocity here is actually kind of interesting. If anybody has had Newton's uh, law of gravitation, you can calculate how fast the gas is going around here. Basically, you just use F equals ma, and uh, the a is centripetal acceleration, and F is gravity. So solve, and you get the speed of the gas going around. Yeah. So. These cartoons are great, but they don't tell us about light at all, right? So where does the light aspect come in? Well, it turns out that you probably have heard about black body radiation here. Um, black body radiation is when something is in thermal equilibrium, it emits at a certain wavelength with a certain profile. Okay, so this plasma becomes really, really hot. Uh, and it emits at a given temperature. So this is a plot that's just showing what black body radiation looks like for given temperatures. So if I have something that's a 3000 degrees, it's going to look something like this. This is uh, the X axis again is color. And then the Y axis is how much of each color do you have? And then this is showing you the visible range, like what we can actually see with our own eyes. So if you go to something like uh, that's 5000 degrees Kelvin, then it's going to peak over here in the orangey reddish area instead of down at different frequencies. As you go to hotter and hotter temperatures, you go to hotter and hotter, um, to higher and higher uh, frequencies. Okay, yes? Um, why is there a gap between the event horizon and like, the appreciation disk? Ooh. Is it proportional to the velocity of the disk or the size of the Excellent question. Okay, so everybody sees this gap here. This is actually my, my research, so thank you for asking. Uh, so this gap here, when you have a black hole, there's, a, you know, it's, it's kind of like this well, right? Think of the marble in an elastic sheet and this well goes down. When you get down really into that gravitational well, sorry, did you guys hear the question? Okay, I should have asked beforehand. Uh, when you get down into that well, if you imagine trying to orbit in a circle around the black hole, there's a point where you get too far into the black hole's area that you can't orbit in a circle anymore. And when that happens, you start falling in, like straight in instead of going around. And that's, that's called the innermost stable circular orbit or the ISCO. And that's what this is. This is supposed to say all the green stuff is just kind of going around forever and ever, not forever and ever, but for a long time then the stuff inside here is just falling into the black hole. Okay. So this plot of black body things, based off of this, how hot do you think the sun is? Anybody? Yeah. 5,000? Why do you say that? Every single uh, spectrum of 
Yeah, so the sun is like orangey yellowy, right? So it's probably somewhere between this line, which is 5,000, and this line, which is 6,000. And yeah, it turns out that the sun's effective temperature, we call it, is right about 5,500 Kelvin. So if you looked at the sun in this color space, it would lie somewhere in here. Now for a X-ray binary, it's super, super hot. I told you like a million Kelvin, right? And so when you go to really, really hot temperatures, this um, peak wavelength just keeps going and going to shorter and shorter wavelengths. So that's where you get X-rays. Uh, and the, yes, this is the black body radiation. Okay, so these are two different spectra of X-ray binaries. You can see that they have very different shapes here. This one here looks like a black body of what we have just talked about. It has a temperature of about a million Kelvin, but then it has this long tail of even higher energy stuff. Like this is getting up into the gamma rays at such high energy. But then there's also X-ray binaries that look like this. This is actually not really a black body, right? It's kind of it's kind of like widened compared to this picture here. Um, and it kind of has the most energy at 100 keV, whereas this one has the most energy at 1 keV. So this, they look very different, right? And I'm going to have you guess, and I definitely expect 100% success rate on this, which one you think, this, these are the two X-ray binaries I showed earlier, which spectrum do you think is Cygnus X1 and which one do you think is this SS433, okay? So, if you think that this one is Cygnus X1, raise your hand. I know you're not supposed to know the answer. Cygnus X1 is this one, yeah. Nobody thinks you, okay, you guys think, oops, whoa, what just happened there? Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, who thinks that this one is SS433? Interesting, anybody want to tell me why? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So you're saying that because it's lower frequencies, it might be more red. Okay. So these colors are fake. <laughs> unfortunately, um, unfortunately, and also this was a complete trick question. Um, I'm well, sorry to say. Yeah, I think it's they observe it in a certain wavelength and they just translate it into the visible so that we can see it it's it's not it's, it's not you're not actually not. seeing x-rays here right so, yeah okay so <laughs> trick question this was actually cygnus x1 just at different times so if you go back to the year 1996 in april you would see this blue spectrum here that's that I can't remember if it was A or B. You would see this one that's like peaking around 100 kiloelectron volts and doesn't really have that black body shape. And then if you waited just a few months, and you came back and you looked at the same thing, it would look completely different. It would look like this thing here, the one that peaks right around one kiloelectron volt, this one. So this is really interesting. This is weird, right? Like the spectrum of this thing is completely changing. And this is something that X-ray binaries just do. Um, you look at it at one point, and then it just goes through this outburst, and it changes how it looks. These are called state transitions, because this state looks a lot different from this state. And it, there, it's a spectrum. That's why it's called the spectral state transition. OK? And this is like, people don't know why this happens. Do you know why the error bars get larger than the higher energy? Yeah, that's. A good question. It's probably um, instrument, like the detector itself, getting less sensitive. Uh, yeah, I think this is all one instrument doing the detecting, but sometimes they combine different instruments to give you different data points. It's probably the detector. It's log scale. Oh, it's log scale. Yeah, it's also log scale, which makes the air bars look that bad. Yeah, we're going to. Why the dynamics cause some of the shifting of you're asking if the redshifting would cause a change in the spectrum? Yeah. Redshifting like of the accretion disk? Like yeah, any kind of dynamics have to cause the disk. Of the disk? 
So like the star goes behind the black hole and that changes the look or something? Is that the idea? That, yeah, that you could imagine that maybe the star goes behind it and the black hole like warps the light going around it. That's not really, that doesn't explain why the, um, the spectrum changes so much at all. Um, one of the things that we think is happening is that maybe, you know, a star is kind of unstable and it goes through these different outbursts and stuff. And so maybe the star just burps out some gas and it changes how fast you're accreting material. And then you might start accreting more material in one of these states versus the other. And then you have some radiated processes that happen that change how this looks. But uh, we don't really know. And that's kind of one of the things that I'm working on. More questions? Okay. Now it's time for another two truths and a lie. No cheating this time. Okay, you have one minute. All right, everybody, bring it back in. Short, short little debate. I can give a one in three chance of being right anyway. Okay, so who thinks that this first one up here is a lie? Dang. Who thinks that the second one is a lie? I just gave it away. Who thinks the third one is a lie? <laughs> You're like half raising your hand. Yeah, I'm gonna have to raise for all of them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> cheating. That's one and a half. You can't do that. You can't half vote for one. One can't. I promise you, this is not a trick question. The, yeah, this I one, one of them is true. One of them is yes. <laughs> That's not allowed. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think everybody guessed correctly that this number one is false, actually, because um, the US has actually never landed a rover on the moon. We've landed them on the Mars, but not on the moon. And the first planned mission is in 2024. I think that's pretty cool and also kind of wild. And then also, yes, if you put wings on, and you like didn't die from breathing in methane, then uh, you could fly on Titan. And there's a nice XKCD about that if you want to go look it up. So the spin of the black hole does actually affect the accretion disk. You ruined my punchline for this by asking about the innermost stable circular orbit. But basically, the um, spin of the black hole does change how much that space time is bending, right? And so that changes where your orbits are, and that changes where the location of this innermost stable circular orbit is, and that changes what the accretion disk looks like. So yes. the faster it spins, does it get bigger or smaller? Yeah, so the ISCO actually gets smaller when the black hole is spinning faster, which is um, like you can imagine trying to go around and just like falling in faster. Yeah, Ruben? Yeah. Does what? Does quantum spin ever play a role in black hole spin? Uh, that's a question for Tyler. <laughs> um, not that we know of in these astrophysical black holes. Yeah, it's it's like everything I do is possible. Yeah, except um, there are some really high energy effects that bring in QED effects, but generally everything's possible. So the explanation of uh, how it's excavation is the faster uh, light is, the smaller the accretion disk is. The larger the accretion disk is, actually, because the that um, innermost stable circular orbit gets smaller, and so the accretion disk can get closer and closer to the black hole. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah clear. It's a GR class. Yeah, it is. It's a GR class. Okay, um, we're getting towards the end, so I definitely wanted to show you a little bit more of what I actually do and what an actuary binary actually looks like. Um, so what I do is I take equations and I put them on a computer. Okay, so you might have heard of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, finding solutions to this is like one of those millennium problems where you get a million dollars or something if you solve it. Um, but what I do is I take those that fluid equation, so it describes fluids, and then I add Maxwell's equations to it. So anybody in intra and in probably has heard of Maxwell's equations. Um, but that's not hard enough. So what I do with that is I add general relativity to it, right? Because black holes, you need to know general relativity. And when you do that, you get these equations right here. 
And uh, unless you've had general relativity, or even if you have, don't expect you to know these names. But for instance, this equation here, this is three equations all in one. But this is just mass conservation of mass. You can't create or destroy mass. This is just conservation of energy. And this is um, just the magnetic field of all of them. Yeah. So this is the kind of math that I do and that um, the computer solves for me. Then what I do is um, put it on a supercomputer. So I think I once calculated that if I ran one of my simulations on my laptop, it would take 300 years. <laughs> yeah, OK. So I use a supercomputer to do all these things. Um, and this is an example. So what we're looking at here, oh, that's what we're looking at here is um, a picture of density. This is the initial condition for like what I put into the computer and let it evolve those equations. So this is zoomed out. This is that looking at the donut like edge on, right? So you can see this um, is part of it. It's a really wide donut, okay? So you can see the donut starting to come in over here. And then this left panel here is just zooming in right there. Okay, so as it, as it plays, you can see that the inside of the donut it's kind of starting to wobble a little bit, falling in. Uh -oh. And then the zoom in starts to show stuff. And there, that looks a little bit like my cartoon, right? Yeah, so this is a um, simulation that I actually didn't do this one. Somebody else put it on YouTube, so I used that. Um, but the stuff that I do is this. Yeah. This is <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Wow. So the answer is actually that it can be either. <laughs> it can be either, which is a very interesting property of these equations. When you don't include uh, light or radiation, these equations can actually describe both a supermassive black hole and a stellar mass black hole. So what I do if I actually want to compare it to real data is I um, take that and then add photons to it, and that's what changes how it looks afterwards. Okay, so, yeah. What? It's a um, Ohm's law sort of a thing, so you can eliminate the electric field with magnetic field. Yeah, so he was asking why I don't do electric fields, basically, and it's because there's some assumptions that let me uh, write the electric field in terms of the magnetic field and currents. Yeah. He's asking how we choose the metric, which is basically asking how do we choose what the mass of the black hole and the spin of the black hole is, because that's what determines the space time around it. Um, so again, the mass doesn't really matter because we can just scale it afterwards. It's a scale free simulation. Um, but the, the spin of the black hole is important. And you just change it to see what happens, basically. <laughs> yeah, some people do non-spinning black holes, but if you're doing a jet, jets extract energy from the spin of the black hole into uh, a jet, then you need to do a spinning black hole. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Okay. Yeah, so just really fast, some mysteries. I kind of went through a little of these in my talk already, but you remember those different spectral states that I showed you. We're uh, still trying to figure out what causes the um, accretion disk to switch between those different modes. Um, there's a lot of research going around on that, a lot of different models for that. And then just generally, how do you model accretion disks? Um, the simulation that I showed you before didn't have any light or radiation in it. Um, and to actually do that, you need to involve both electrons and protons. Uh, then there's another aspect that a lot of simulations miss, which is um, usually we think from observations that there's kind of a hot gas floating above the accretion disk, and that's called the corona. Uh, and then things like, how do we actually measure a black hole's mass or spin? And measuring spin is actually pretty tricky, especially from an accretion disk. Okay, and then, uh, I was told to kind of tell you what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. That kind of falls into three different categories, as you might expect. Uh, one is learning from other people, reading papers, going through textbooks, talking to colleagues or groupmates. Then there's teaching other people. I'm here now. 
um, writing a paper, uh, talking to other graduate students because I'm a fifth year. Uh, everybody kind of comes to me to ask questions, as RP knows. Uh, and then another thing is like teaching myself, so creating this new knowledge that I'm in grad school for, right? So this is designing my simulations, making plots to learn about my simulations, judging if they're if I think they're being physical or not, and things like that. So for instance, the struggle today is why do I have negative temperature in my simulations? Because I don't want negative temperature. Unlike unlike Tyler and some quantum people, <laughs> negative temperature is not a thing that should happen in my simulation. So I'm trying to debug that right now. Okay. And uh, with that, I am done. You may ask me all sorts of questions. Or you may not ask me any Thanks. questions. Well, well, yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, really quick, I want to say thank you. Uh, we have a feedback survey. If you guys want to scan that QR code or go to that link, uh, just to let us know how we can change these, make these talks even better. Uh, and if you are wanting to help out with some CU Prime talks in the future, uh, we need plenty of help with the setup, with ordering pizza and getting the technology working. So feel free to talk to me afterwards uh, if you would like to get started doing that. Um, yeah, and we have about five minutes for questions. I'll let you monitor that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. The QR code up. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Black holes that are spinning on more than one axis. On more than one axis? Yeah. So I guess that would be um, like the intrinsic spin of the black hole, which the black hole itself is rotating. And then maybe it's like going around the binary like this. So that would be like the orbital or the angular momentum of the black hole and then an orbital angular momentum. Kind of the, the physics way to put that. So you can have a black hole that's spinning like this and it's going around the star like this. Uh, yes. But the black hole itself, like if it's spinning like this and this, then it's just spinning. Well, I, I mean, I'm not, this isn't demonstrating, but you know, it, like you can describe it with one, spinning around one axis. Yeah. My cat's name is Nermal. My, my mom named him after a dark river of a sweet nephew. And uh, yeah, he's so really funny here. Yeah. Um, similar to the spin question, do you ever observe black holes with like, uh, with uh, two different axes of accretion disks? So, like, out of two galaxies collide or whatever, so we end up with accretion disks that are uh, not in play with each other? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And actually, so you can imagine if you have two black holes, as you said, they merge and then like one black hole pointed this way, one black hole pointed this way. That's, I mean, if you have two black holes, right, which um, the study of that accretion is just kind of a whole another field because there's all sorts of stuff that goes on. But for instance, LIGO and LISA are looking at um, how that inclination angle changes what you see in gravitational waves. Kind of another interesting thing is what if your star comes in and it doesn't line up with the spin of the black hole already. So your spin, your black hole is spinning this way. <laughs> and then your star comes in and it starts going like this. That's called a tilted accretion disk. I think I actually have a video of that. Uh, yeah, so when that happens, all sorts of funky stuff starts happening. So this is another plot that is of density. So the black hole spin is pointing straight up, so it's rotating like this. And then the accretion disk was uh, rotating in a different direction. I think you can that here, it would come around like this instead of like this. And this is uh, showing how the disk is bending here. This is the density. So this left panel is zoomed in and this right panel is huge. And so the left side, you can see it kind of like turned on its side and then it kind of turns back to the other side far away. So that sort of thing can happen if your um, the stuff that's falling onto the black hole isn't aligned with the way the black hole is spinning. Oh, I think it just changed directions, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I have all the videos where the green star and the shot where the 
Yeah, so the question was um, in that video where we saw the jets coming out, where are the jets coming from? Are they coming from inside? Because we just discussed that you can't get out from inside an event horizon. And yeah, so the answer there is they are not coming from inside the, the event horizon, right? Because that would violate things. There's um, ways that it can um, extract energy via the Penrose process, which involves like extracting energy from the black hole spin itself. Uh, and then also there are things like um, the magnetic fields are configured such that they launch these jets. Does that answer your question? It's like how all kind of make this uh, yeah. yeah, you can have like um, certain configurations of um, the magnetic field that lead to the winds going straight up. It, it's it's a what you might be thinking of is like a conservation sort of a thing. Like you're coming in this way, and then how do you end up going up that way? You can have that when you have a torque. So you change angular momentum and you have a torque on something. So basically, these large scale magnetic fields are providing a torque on the gas. That's what's changing it and, and shooting it a different direction than it came in. Anna. <laughs> that was, I was kind of debating about this, right? Because somebody asked me this and I was trying to decide. I don't think Saturn's wings are falling in. So I don't think they would actually be considered an accretion disk. But that goes into what is an accretion disk, right? Does stuff have to be, can it just orbit? Like, is the Earth around the sun an accretion <laughs> disk? I hope not. <laughs> I read somewhere that Earth yeah, I don't know if that's true, but you can imagine that the stuff just falls onto Earth or uh, Jupiter, for instance. Um, and then, you know, Saturn just has these rings that basically, in order for stuff to fall onto a black hole, it has a certain amount of angular momentum. And in order to get closer to the black hole, it needs to have smaller angular momentum. So it needs to not conserve angular momentum, so it needs to have a torque. And I don't know if there's any mechanism for that in Saturn's rings. Did you have a question? Uh, good idea. I guess it's just clarification. So, yeah. Uh, first question is about like, so accretion, and accretion is the definition, it's just uh, matter that's over orbiting around the sun, and that's not falling from that matter, it's falling into it. Right? And that's the first clarification. Another one was, is the reason why um, it's all matter, like for example, when it's a star at the center of a black hole, um, the reason why all matter doesn't get sucked in into that black hole is because of that concentration of angular momentum. Yeah, so if you imagine um, a star orbiting a black hole, if it's far enough away, like really far away, it's it's not gonna fall in, right? Like the Earth doesn't actually fall in, or, yeah, the Earth doesn't fall into the sun. And that's because angular momentum is conserved. So let's think about the accretion disk since that's what I was talking about. When you have disks and rings of material, those are also just going to orbit, right? The key idea there is um, these disks or these rings of material that make up the accretion disk are kind of rubbing against each other. So they have some sort of like friction, right? You can imagine just like one ring trying to push against another and that lets it lose angular momentum and fall in and that's why um, it's different from the earth orbiting the sun um, it's actually a very interesting question in accretion physics for a long time we didn't know how that happened because if you estimate the friction due to uh, just molecules rubbing against each other it turns out it's way too small like all orders of magnitude so small too small it's, it's a really really too small. Uh, and so there's an innovation in 1991 that was saying, okay, what if we have magnetic field lines that are connecting these different rings? And that kind of creates an effective friction. And that, we think, is probably what actually lets stuff fall into the black hole. Like, I have a couple of questions just to go to simulation. Yeah. First, just like physically, like, how many nodes do you want to go on? 
Mm, yeah, okay, so the question was what kind of computer, um, how many nodes, I, I don't know if that means anything to people, and then it's a GPU accelerated. Uh, so that was my stat about the 300 hours on a single core. So usually I run on a supercomputer owned by NASA, um, and I run on 128 nodes. Yeah, four or five days. 128. So a node has a certain number of cores. And the, the cores all work together and they share memory and stuff like that. So it's it's something like a million CPU hours. That's um, what I was saying. Like if I ran it on a, a single core on my laptop, it would take 300 years. Yeah, and some people have made this code run on GPUs, but um, I don't have that code. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess the other question so what Claire is asking is basically like if you take the general the general relativity equations, the Einstein field equations, then energy is mass and mass is energy, and so any little mass would bend the metric. And so then I'd have to like change the, the warping of space time all the time. And the answer is no. What we, what we assume is basically that the accretion disk and the gas in the disk is really light compared to the black hole. And so we just evolved a care metric and the gas sits on top of that. So great questions. Uh, if anybody has any more, are you happy to stick around for a few minutes? Yep. Uh, feel free to talk to Lydia. Uh, but yeah. let's thank Leo one more time. Thank you.